Hello everybody, welcome to the first Revive webinar. I'm Laura Piddock, Head of Scientific Affairs at the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARDP. GARDP is a joint initiative by the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative and the World Health Organization. GARDP's mission is to work in partnership with the public and private sectors to develop and deliver new treatments for bacterial infections where drug resistance is present or emerging or for which inadequate treatment exists. At the beginning of 2018, we launched Revive, a website that is an online hub to connect the antimicrobial discovery, research and development community. The aim is to support early career researchers and others entering the field by facilitating access to experienced experts as well as developing and collecting relevant resources. This webinar is the first of a series which we will be executing in the course of this year. Three topics will be covered in this series, clinical development for non-developers. The first, traditional development, tiers A and B. The second, development of antibacterial drugs targeting specific pathogens. And the third webinar, development of antibacterial drug enhancer combinations, including non-traditional products. This series of webinars is aimed at providing a perspective upon prioritization and is based on clinical development risk today. Many of the examples in this webinar focus on expertise gained in the US and is based on FDA requirements, but it should be noted that many of the key points are relevant throughout the world. Drugs discovered today will not enter the marketplace for at least eight years. However, it should be noted that there's new guidance by the FDA on limited population antibacterial drugs, LPAD, and new pathogen-specific guidance from the FDA. I'm delighted to introduce our webinar speaker, David Schleis. He's had a long and distinguished career in anti-infectives, both as a practicing physician and academia and industry in the US. And he's well recognized for his scientific interest in antimicrobial resistance, as well as for researching and developing new drugs. Although recently retired, he remains active and is an editor for Antimicrobial Agents in Chemotherapy and writes a well-known blog, Antibiotics, The Perfect Storm, and remains active in many other areas to do with antimicrobials. He's also written a novel, which I can recommend to anyone who wishes to understand about discovering research and development of new antibacterials and the particular challenges that can be encountered. Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Laura and uh, Guard P for the opportunity to uh, present this series of webinars, uh, this being the first. Uh, and as you probably understand, every decision that you make during the discovery phase has a potential effect on the risk that any resu resulting product will make it to market. S the scientific risk is actually the greatest one. First of all, there's the choice of the target that you make, with some targets being easier to uh, drug than others how you evaluate your screening hits and how you progress them along the, the uh, assays required to move them forward, your optimization strategy once you choose a lead, and then of course the uh, preclinical risk as you get into uh, studying safety issues around uh, any lead that you may have. All of, this, uh, all of these decisions affect the risk of later clinical development. Um, it's important to understand that uh, there's also a clinical risk. So the biggest risk, as I mentioned, is in the discovery phase where the vast majority of your projects will actually fail, uh, which in a way is a good thing because uh, they're less expensive that way. But there's also a clinical risk. Uh, once you enter phase one development, your first in man studies, there's uh, an 80 to 90% chance of failure. The latest uh, number that I, I saw was uh, only an 11% chance of success given all pharmaceuticals entering development. Uh, 
In the case of antibacterial drugs, this is most often due to unforeseen toxicity or some uh, untoward secondary effects, such as infusion pain from the uh, intravenous injection, uh, phlebitis or, or uh, irritation of the veins, um, gastrointestinal intolerance, or others. The other risk is uh, one where the antibiotic in, uh, in patients simply doesn't work as it should. Most commonly, this is because you've chosen the wrong dose. Uh, occasionally, it's because for reasons uh, that you couldn't predict, the exposure in humans was less than you would have predicted from your experience uh, in preclinical development in animals. Uh, another risk is the unexpected rapid emergence of uh, resistance. Given our ability to predict appropriate dosing uh, and predict pharmacokinetics in people based on animal studies and our ability to predict emergence of drug resistance, these problems really should not lead to clinical failure today. So before embarking on a new discovery project, one of the most important things uh, to do is to know where you're going. To do this, you need to understand medical needs today. And as Laura mentioned, since your product won't come out to the market for at least eight years and more likely 10 or 15 years, you need to try and project to the needs of the, of the future, the needs that will arise tomorrow. Um, to do this, you need to enlist the help of a physician specialized in infectious diseases, preferably one who has an understanding of discovery yeah. science. Based on this, you would create a target product profile or TPP. And I'm gonna show you an example of one of these shortly. But this profile can be preliminary or general, but it's important that it be one that you can live with and that you can discipline yourself and your team uh, around its requirements. Um, so medical needs. What I've listed here are the World Health Organization priority pathogens. And this list is actually similar to the one uh, that's been promulgated by the Centers for Disease Control in the United States. Um, so the, on the critical list are uh, carbapenem resistant gram negatives, including Acinetobacter baumani, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Enterobacteriaceae. And of course, most of the carbapenem resistant strains I'm talking about will also produce beta-lactamases, either as the basis of their carbapenem resistance or their, the basis of resistance to other beta-lactame antibiotics. Other high priority pathogens include the Enterococcus, uh, Staph aureus, especially methicillin resistant Staph aureus, uh, and um, others. One of the important uh, emerging resistant pathogens that we shouldn't forget is Neisseria gonorrhea, uh, where there have been re reports of totally resistant pathogens uh, most recently. Um, there are also clinical indications, and by clinical indications, I mean uh, disease states. Uh, for example, hospital-acquired and ventilator-associated pneumonia is a clinical indication where there's a high unmet medical need. Uh, we have a tremendous need for oral therapy of complicated urinary tract infections so that we can either prevent the uh, necess necessity of admitting patients to the hospital for intravenous therapy, hospitals are not good for your health, <laughs> and um, or to get patients out of the hospital earlier by being able to switch them to effective oral therapy. There are other indications that are rarely studied, such as uh, osteomyelitis, so infection of the bone, endocarditis, infection of uh, heart valves, diabetic foot infections, where the medical need is also high, uh, but these uh, indications are difficult to study in a way that leads to regulatory approval uh, as it stands today. So a target product profile summarizes the desired R&D outcome, uh, and they play a central role in the entire discovery process and the development process, including effective optimization of drug candidates, decision-making within your team and within your organization, and design of clinical research strategies, as well as uh, uh, you need these to be able to communicate where you're going with the regulatory authorities when you finally arrive there. 
I should point out that these target product profiles can, to a certain extent, evolve, but it's important not to backtrack on those uh, uh, requirements that you've set out that you believe are, in fact, requirements. So first of all, you need to think about what indications, so which diseases am I? Am I aiming to treat? Am I, is it the most important one hospital-acquired pneumonia, or is it urinary tract infection, or is it something else? Which patients are you treating? Patients in the community, patients in the hospital, or both? Clinical efficacy. Do you want uh, your product to kill pathogens uh, you know, to a certain extent at a certain dose? I mean, how, how important is the efficacy, uh, extent of efficacy, if you like? Uh, their safety and tolerability. What kind and how many adverse events would you be able to tolerate for your antibiotic? In general, the answer is few to none for antibiotics. Stability is a consideration. Route of administration, of course, you need to think about. That should it be oral? Should it be IV? Could, should it be both? Um, and then dose, dosing frequency is also important. How often is it reasonable to give uh, a drug in the hospital, maybe three times a day or even four times a day is okay. In the community, probably once a day is better. So you need to think about things like that. So this is an example of an actual target product profile that was developed uh, back at, at uh, Novexcel when we were developing Avibactam. And uh, so Avibactam was on its way uh, in clinical development, and we were uh, going to develop a backup, uh, or not a backup, but actually a follow-on drug to improve the properties of Avibactam. So we said, okay, for, so Avibactam is a beta-lactamase beta inhibitor. And um, Avibactam itself is active against a variety of classes of beta-lactamases, including uh, AMPC, which is kind of the chromosomal beta-lactamase of a number of ent enterobacteriaceae, and uh, hydrolyzes uh, cephalosporins as well as uh, penicillins. Class A uh, enzymes are important uh, beta-lactamases, and they're uh, also both cephalosporins and uh, penicillins, including some, uh, both for AMPC and Class A, some of the newer cephalosporins. But we also, so Avibactam covers all those already, but we also wanted activity against class D, uh, uh, class D uh, beta-lactamases, um, which Avibactam is less active against in some cases, especially the class D carbapenemases that account for resistance both in Enterobacteriaceae and in Acinebacter baumannii. Uh, to the carbapenem antibiotics. So we wanted to include those in the spectrum we were going for. Um, for a drug like that, we thought if it was only available IV or intravenously, that would be fine. Uh, a benefit would be, okay, if you can have an oral drug as well, you can develop an IV oral switch, that would be even better. Um, if your compound was only gonna work in enterobacteriaceae, since there are a number of drug uh, beta-lactamase inhibitors available for enterobacteriaceae, but there are only a few, if any, that work against these extended spectrum beta-lactamases, an oral drug we thought was essential. Um, targeting beta-lactamase producing uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and, a, and Acinebacter baumannii we thought was uh, important for the IV drug, but of course an oral drug we could work on other things. If we wanted to target the community, we had to have an oral formulation. That was absolutely required. And uh, if what we came up with had a more narrow beta-lactamase spectrum that is less than what we wanted to start with, we agreed that we would have to have an oral preparation. So you can see this TPP gives you choices along the way, but also gives you requirements that you, you would have to meet. Uh, of course, the TPP originally was much longer, included a lot more information around safety and dosing, but um, uh, I don't have time to go into that today. But you can get an idea of how you would construct a TPP from this example. So today we're going to talk about basic clinical development pathways, uh, the, the pathways that have been used for a long time to develop antibiotics. Um, these pathways are uh, uh, the least risky in terms of clinical risk. Um, 
They require fair numbers of patients, which I'll show you uh, in some detail. Uh, they're the most straightforward uh, to develop. They require that your product have broad or moderately broad spectrum. So these, are, these pathways probably will not work well for drugs that only target a single species with some exceptions. For example, uh, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, uh, since there are a vast majority or a majority of Staph aureus infections in many areas, you can develop an MRSA drug. Uh, more easily with these pathways. But for other uh, pathogens, such as the gram-negatives, um, uh, you need a, a relatively broad spectrum to develop a, an antibiotic using these pathways that I'll be talking about. So uh, the way people have started to think about this is, is in terms of uh, four tiers. Uh, and these uh, tiers were first described uh, in, an, in a paper by John Rex and his colleagues in Lancet in 2013, where tier A uh, and tier A and B are the, one, the uh, pathways we're gonna be talking about today. Tier A requires two phase three trials. And it used to be that uh, every antibiotic that, had, that was developed had to uh, undergo two phase three trials for every clinical indication that um, uh, they, that was being targeted, and I'll show you an example of that shortly. Um, and tier D was the other available pathway, and this was developed for uh, diseases that you could not essentially study in humans, such as anthrax. Uh, so uh, in anthrax, you use essentially an animal model, you use it you look at pharmacokinetics in people and you bridge from what you find in animals to what you find in people based on uh, pharmacokinetics. What Rex and colleagues uh, uh, proposed was intermediate pathways between tier A and tier D, and they call them tier B and tier C, where tier B included a phase three trial, one phase three trial, plus one or more other smaller studies and uh, they could be pathogen-focused studies. And tier C uh, was uh, strictly smaller studies. And the, the question for regulatory authorities has been, um, as you reduce the size of the studies, you increase the risk that there will be a problem once you get on the market. So uh, what you can see is that smaller data sets, uh, as you go from tiers A to D, increase potential risk uh, as you go to market as far for, for patients. So tier A, nobody, almost nobody does uh, two phase three trials per indication today, but there are two exceptions. Both Tetraphase and Nabriva are running such trials. So uh, uh, Tetraphase is doing two trials in complicated intra-abdominal infection, and Nabriva is doing two trials in community-acquired pneumonia. But most other uh, antibiotics that have recently been developed um, have uh, followed more of uh, two trials in different indications, one trial in each, or a phase three trial plus a small study, uh, as in tier B. So the standard traditional non-inferiority trial comparing, test, uh, comparing a test article to a gold standard comparator is the way most antibiotics have been developed. As I mentioned, it's best for broad spectrum drugs uh, or for treating uh, staphylococcal infections. As I mentioned, two trials used to be required for each indication. But streamlined pathways now exist where a single non-inferiority trial per indication is acceptable for antibacterials, especially those active against resistant pathogens or which have other properties such as an improved safety profile that meets an important medical need. So I want you to think about, first of all, innovative drugs active against resistant pathogens. But let's talk about non-inferiority non trials, first of all. Um, the reason we do non-inferiority trials is statistically it's not possible to show equivalence. So what we try and show is statistically that one drug, your drug, your test agent, is not inferior to some gold standard comparator that uh, physicians uh, use uh, normally to treat whatever infection it is that you're studying. But there's a lot of confusion about this because what um, 
the regulatory authorities have done is they've established a statistical margin. And frequently that statistical margin called the non-inferiority margin is around 10%. And you'll hear people say, well, if uh, that means that your drug can be up to 10% inferior to your uh, comparator drug and still be approved. True or false? Well, at least it's very misleading, that statement. If the test agent shows that the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval crosses minus 10%, it's considered not to be non-inferior at the 10% level. The uh, 95% confidence, 95 confidence interval could still include a non-inferior or even superior result, uh, but uh, a non-inferiority at the 10% level could not be concluded under these circumstances. In other words, whether one meets the margin it's a, is a statistical calcula calculation and may not imply that the test agent is actually 10% inferior to the comparator. Um, now, why do we care about the margin? Because this statistical margin is the primary determinant of the numbers of patients you have to enroll in the trial. And the number of patients you have to enroll in the trial is uh, directly related to the cost of the trial and the amount of time it takes for a trial to be concluded. So the amount of time it takes for your drug to get to the market. So this is an, an old example um, based on discussions that uh, we had when I was working at Wyeth, we had with the FDA where we proposed a 15% margin, shown here as a 15% delta. Uh, and the total numbers for the number of trials, we were gonna carry out trials in pneumonia, trials in skin, trials in intra-abdominal infection, and trials in hospital-acquired pneumonia. And we proposed 3,700 patients for all of those clinical indications. The FDA proposed that we carry out these trials at a 10% margin. And this, as you can see, <laughs> very considerably increased the number of patients required. So the margin is a very important number when it comes to uh, developing your antibiotic. Now, the FDA and in fact, uh, the European Regulatory Agency, EMA, have evolved very considerably uh, in recent years. So before 2012, as I mentioned, the FDA required two independent non-inferiority trials for each indication. Today, you can run a single non-inferiority trial in skin infection plus a single non-inferiority trial in pneumonia and get approval in both indications. So for two trials, you get two different clinical indications. Um, you can run a single trial in complicated urinary tract infection plus a single trial in complicated intra-abdominal infection and get approval for both indications. So they use one, uh, success in one indication to support what you observe in the next indication. Um, if you, do, you can do a single trial in hospital-acquired pneumonia and or ventilator-associated uh, pneumonia plus a trial in any second indication would allow for approval in both indications. Um, today, uh, and we'll get into this in future webinars, small pathogen-specific trials might be allowed. Um, <coughs> and like I said, we'll talk about that in, in the future. And I'll go into specifics on the margins that uh, they currently use today uh, in a minute. So there are still some problems with running a non-inferiority trial. One of the big ones uh, that we all will have to deal with and we all do deal with is a restriction on the use of prior antibiotics and the use of concomitant antibiotics in trials. Um, and this is especially difficult uh, in trials where you're studying uh, patients with pneumonia, but it remains a problem in general. And the problem is that the prior antibiotics might influence the outcome of the trial in the sense that uh, um, they uh, essentially um, uh, confuse the results, whether the success that you might see is due to your drug uh, or the control drug or the concomitant or previous antibiotics that the patient had, that's the problem. One way to get around this uh, that's been proposed by the regulatory agencies is to do prospective or early enrollment. Some people call this early consent so that 
when you're going to sign somebody up for a trial and they're going to agree to uh, be enrolled, instead of having to do it in an urgent situation where the patient has developed, say, hospital-acquired pneumonia and you want to treat them right away because they're sick, you, you uh, try and pre-enroll them so that they agree that if this might happen to me, you can enroll me in the trial. And this uh, allows for much less delay and you don't have to worry about uh, trying to start an antibiotic that's not in the study before you can actually enroll somebody in the study. So uh, that's one way to deal with this. Um, but this remains an issue for, uh, for us in enrolling patients for trials. Now the margins, uh, so I've listed here the margins that are standardly used by FDA and uh, EMA, and you can see they range from 10 to 12 and a half percent. So you can get an idea of the numbers of patients that would be required for any of these indications. But for target, for antibiotics that would target patients with unmet needs, including those with drug resistant infections, assuming you have a drug, hopefully innovative, that addresses drug resistant infections, this margin can increase, which allows for a more streamlined uh, trial because the regulatory authorities recognize that innovative drugs with activity against resistant pathogens need to get to the market more quickly. So I want to talk about um, basic uh, fixed dose combinations and development pathways for, for fixed dose combinations. These are uh, that can use uh, traditional development pathways. Uh, they're straightforward and they've been used many times before. One early example is the combination of trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole. These are two active antibiotics which happen to target the same pathway in bacterial metabolism. Um, and uh, putting them two together, number one, reduces re rates of resistance and number two, uh, gives you increased uh, antibacterial efficacy. Uh, and as a fixed dose combination, this was uh, developed in a very straightforward way many years ago. The ones that you may be most familiar with are the beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations. Um, and uh, again, this, these are uh, studied and marketed as fixed dose combinations. Uh, and the development pathway for this is, uh, is very straightforward. Um, the kind of new approach that people are thinking about is uh, developing some sort of enhancer drug, again, in fixed dose combination with some partner antibiotic, usually an active antibiotic where the enhancer may or may not be active. Um, and in this case, um, the, like for beta-lactamase inhibitors, the enhancer drug must improve the activity of the partner antibiotic by more than, say, two to three dilutions in vitro and must have similar dramatic effects in vivo in order for this to be uh, an acceptable approach by the regulatory authorities. So this is an important thing to keep in mind for those of you who are thinking about this enhancer approach. And we're gonna cover this in much more detail in the third uh, webinar of this series. But for all of these, uh, as I mentioned, the non-inferior designs are still okay. So uh, beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations. The beta-lactamase inhibitor must have a strong effect on beta-lactamases uh, beta in vitro. And so far, for all the ones that have been marketed, this has been, this, this has been true. Uh, in the clinic, in general, you will need to show some patients that have a beta-lactam-resistant infection who respond to your beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combination where the combination is actually active. Um, now, there has been a recent exception to this where, for example, uh, the, the exception was uh, meropenem vaborbactam, which very specifically targets uh, um, Enterobacteriaceae uh, or Pseudomonas expressing like a KPC beta-lactamase or, or a serine-based carbapenemase, where vaborbactam will, would inhibit that enzyme. But uh, it's almost impossible to roll, enroll sufficient numbers of patients in a trial that have an infection like that. So can you use a, a PKPD argument to make the argument that given that it works against other gram negatives and given the activity of the beta-lactamase inhibitor and given the pharmacokinetic exposure of the, the two drugs together, um, 
it's logical to conclude that this would also work uh, in the case of uh, KPC expressing uh, infections caused by KPC expressing organisms. Um, and regulatory authorities will, will, will and did accept these arguments. Uh, the other thing, the other uh, pathway that's available uh, in uh, the FDA in the US that's not available in Europe is uh, what's called what the, the FDA calls uh, Section 505B2 of their regulations. But this provision expressly permits the FDA to rely for approval of a new drug on data not developed by the applicant. And this could be published literature or the agency's finding uh, of safety and effectiveness of an approved drug. And this has been done twice, one for meropenem vaporbactam, where meropenem was the previously approved drug, and the other for keftazidine avibactam, where keftazidine was the previously approved drug. So in the case of keftazidine avibactam, that was approved uh, based on mainly phase two clinical data plus uh, what the agency already knew about uh, keftazidine. This uh, table gives you an, an idea of the activity of these beta-lactamase inhibitors against very various beta-lactamase enzymes. Um, and the, I the IC50s, so the inhibitory concentration 50 is expressed in micromolar. And what you can see is that for many of these beta-lactamases, um, these, enzymes, these enzymes are very active or sorry, these inhibitors are very active uh, for many of these enzymes. Uh, you can see that avibactam is much more active against KPC than say an older inhibitor like tazobactam. Um, the same thing is true for the AMPC enzymes. For the AMPC enzymes, uh, where, uh, let's see, where, uh, Tazobactam is not very active, and avibactam is very active. Uh, now, this also works uh, for MICs, so uh, which you'd expect. So here's the ceftazidime MIC 90 in micrograms per mil for E. coli that express uh, uh, an extended spectrum beta-lactamase. And here's when keftazidine is combined with avibactam. And this is the case for all of these different beta-lactamase producing organisms. Uh, so these are dramatic effects. And this is the kind of effect when you develop a combination such as this or with an enhancer that you, you need to think about. Okay, so going forward, how are we going to address unmet needs using these uh, other uh, development pathways such as tier B and tier C. Tier B again requires an innovative drug that meets an unmet clinical need such as resistance. Here you can carry out a single non-inferiority uh, trial in a traditional indication such as urinary tract infection for example plus a second trial in a second traditional indication, such as intra-abdominal infection, or a single trial that may target resistant pathogens. If you do something like this, and this was the case both for the approvals for keftazidine avibactam originally, and now for meropenem vaporbactam, the label will be more restrictive, and it will restrict you to treatment uh, of patients who have few options. And tier C specifically, we're gonna cover in uh, future webinars. So keftazidine avibactam, as I mentioned, was approved by the FDA based on two phase two trials, uh, one in complicated intra-abdominal infections and one in, in complicated urinary tract infections based on this uh, FDA pathway. 25% of the infections roughly were due to keftazidine resistant organisms and the combination was effective in uh, the vast majority of those cases. Later phase three trials uh, done uh, in standard uh, non-inferiority uh, design uh, in, uh, went on to uh, uh, show efficacy in hospital-acquired pneumonia and ventilator-associated uh, pneumonia. Uh, and there was a, a, an additional trial looking at keftazidine avibactam against keftazidine-resistant uh, infections. Um, but that was uh, an example of one way to use a, a tier B pathway to get a drug approved earlier. <clears throat> 
Another example is plazomycin, which hasn't yet been approved, but uh, the company that developed plazomycin, um, Acaogen, designed two trials. The first of all was a single non-inferiority trial in complicated urinary tract infection, but the second trial was a, a superiority design trial studying uh, the effect of plazomycin in, in patients with highly resistant uh, gram-negative infections. They studied bloodstream infections and, uh, and uh, pneumonia. And you can see that uh, the numbers of, inf of infections of patients uh, were very, very small. But you can also see what they compared to was they compared to um, colistin-containing regimens versus plazomycin-containing regimens. Uh, and what they showed was that uh, there was a marked uh, decrease in all-cause mortality at day 28 in patients who received plazomycin as opposed to patients who received colistin. So this is a superiority design trial, very small numbers, but nevertheless uh, statistically significant and potentially clinically important uh, result. So does a drug need to be studied in the context of highly resistant bacteria, highly resistant infection? Uh, from a regular, regulatory point of view, the answer is no, you don't have to do that. Uh, you can study infections in usually encountered resistance within the context of a standard clinical trial, and that's perfectly acceptable. Then you can use your in vitro data and your PK, PKPD data to help make the argument that the test agent is active against resistant infections clinically. Um, on the other hand, commercially, it might be important to have at least some infections uh, studied uh, with highly resistant infections, just so you can explain to physicians that in fact the, the drug works. Because it's very difficult uh, to explain to physicians out in the marketplace uh, this PKPD argument. It's much easier to show them cases uh, similar to cases that they might encounter. Uh, so your commercial group might be interested in you providing these data. But from a regulatory point of view, you don't have to have these data. So. Non-inferiority trial designs are a necessary and essential part of antibiotic development today. Um, modern design non-inferiority studies, uh, including uh, conducted in the setting of so-called usual drug resistance versus a high-quality compar comparator, produce reliable data. Strong in vitro data and a complete PKPD uh, data set are of increasing importance, especially if you want to uh, take advantage of the streamlined designs that uh, the regulatory authorities have, have, have now have available. And these trials in general are the lowest risk designs allowing for antibacterial drug approval, but they require a relatively broad spectrum drug such that these trials are actually feasible, uh, or they must target specific pathogens that are very frequent causes of infection such as MRSA. Thank you, David. That was really informative. We have already received some audience questions during the presentation. But for those of you who have not yet asked their questions, please send them to us via the questions pane in your webinar control panel. We will do our best to discuss as many questions as possible during this Q&A session. So the first question for David is, in which phase of the discovery process should you create your target product profile? Uh, hi, everybody. Can you hear me there? Yes, we can. Thank you, David. Excellent. Um, so the, the target product profile is something that you really need to establish very early. Uh, if it should be sometime shortly after you've done your screening, because otherwise uh, you don't know what secondary assays you might want to run after screening. You don't know how you would optimize the compound after screening. Uh, so I would say this is something that you need to establish very early. Thank you. So our second question is, what is your estimate for how long a conventional phase three program takes when choosing only complicated urinary tract infections as an indication for approval? 
Um, those trials usually run in roughly 18 months, and then you add an additional period of time, six months or so, to get all your paperwork in and uh, to the agency, and maybe you know, and maybe get a decision within another six months after that. But the trial itself, I would say, on the order of uh, 18 months. Thank you. So a follow-up question would be, what would be the shortest amount of time you could do a trial versus the longest amount of time in your experience this has taken? Mm, that's a good question. Um, well, I, I know of one trial that actually took five years to complete. Um, and I believe that this is the uh, linazolid versus vancomycin in hospital acquired pneumonia caused by uh, MRSA. I believe that took about five years. Um, more recent hospital acquired pneumonia trials have taken three years to complete, whereas in the old days, uh, we used to be able to get them done also in 18 months. Um, so those are kind of the long, longest trials uh, I know about. You can always shorten the length of time of your trials by adding more centers. Uh, but the problem is, as you add more centers, you increase costs very considerably. So there's a, you know, there's a balance between length of trial and increased cost for adding centers. Thank you. The third question is, when you talk about small studies to complement tier B, is there a minimum number of patients that will be acceptable? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So um, the, the regulatory authorities uh, require at least 300 patients treated with the test drug uh, as a uh, safety database. So the minimum, but that includes everybody in phase one and phase two and phase three and anybody who's received the test article. Um, in terms of the efficacy part of this, I don't think we know yet. I think it, it will depend on the design of the trial um, and the particular drug and the particular indication you're, you're going for. Um, but, but I don't think I can give a general answer to the minimum number required for an efficacy study. But stay tuned because that's going to come up again uh, in the next two webinars. And as a follow-up to that, um, clearly some of the uh, requirements are different between the FDA in the United States and the European Medicines Agency. Does this also, this difference also get reflected in the minimum numbers of patients currently required? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, but basically what people do, because most uh, um, companies want their drugs to be marketed globally, they simply run trials such that they can be approved by both regulatory agencies, which means you kind of have to run the maximum number, <laughs> uh, if you like, between the two agencies. But they do differ. Uh, I think I mentioned in one of my slides that some of the indications, for example, in um, Europe have a 12.5% margin with 10% in the US and vice versa. But basically most people just run the 10% margins to be able to be approved in both uh, regions. Um, there are other differences that are important. There are a number of other options available for people in Europe um, that aren't available in the US. And again, these are things that we can get to in the next two webinars when we talk about um, small studies, uh, pathogen specific drugs, and um, so called enhancers in non traditional approaches. Thank you. So, question four is antibiotics with non inferiority in clinical trials for infections in small numbers of people are less likely to be made into drugs due to the poor economic return as they will not be used in many people once licensed. Will this conundrum be solved by charging a high price for such antibiotics? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, 
so far the empirical evidence from experience with say Avicaz um, and a couple of other new drugs is uh, no, <laughs> that high prices do not work well. Um, so yeah, so far high prices do not work. I think to solve this problem, we're gonna need another um, sort of uh, uh, business model uh, such as uh, yeah, some kind of market entry reward or something. I think if we don't get something like that, um, we're, we're going to continue to be in trouble here. Okay. Uh, the next question is, one aspect of approval is the size of the safety database, which often requires a significant number of patients exposed to the test product. What are your thoughts on the aspect of this mission and its potential impact of efficacy studies? Well, the safety, well, yeah, the safety data, database doesn't, I, I don't think is gonna impact too much on the efficacy studies um, because for example, in non-inferiority trials, the number of patients you study are much larger than the minimum um, safety databases base that's required. But it's important to make some distinctions here. I mean, first of all, um, in traditional development, uh, the, a normal safety database is like 1,200 patients or something like that. Uh, and that's about the size of a single, or maybe even two, it's about the size of two non-inferiority trials. So, so that's the number you're talking about. When you get into these small, uh, smaller studies that might be used to support a pathogen-specific antibiotic or something like that, the minimum safety database is 300 patients. Um, and it might be true for a drug being used in non-inferiority designs, but is still um, meeting an unmet, uh, an important unmet medical need, that the safety database would be lower. Um, the re safety database requirement might be lower, but you're still going to uh, you're still going to have to carry out a non-inferiority trial. What might happen is the non-inferiority margin might be um, broadened such that fewer patients would have to be enrolled. Uh, but I think that's, um, uh, you know, you're still going to have a fairly large safety database beyond the minimum 300 uh, patients that have been talked in, about both in Europe and in the U.S. in guidance for uh, development of drugs for unmet needs. Thank you, David. So. The next question is how many different centers and countries must typically be included in a phase three trial to satisfy an FDA or EMA submission? Hmm. Um, it's a good question and I'm not sure I know exactly the, the answer to that. Um, I mean, you, you have to, in most most of these trials are global trials. They are these drugs are studied in several different countries, but um, um, and 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 they're by definition uh, in several different centers. But I, I don't know what if there's a re specific requirement um, uh, around how many different centers and how many different countries you have to include in, for either the FDA or the US or uh, the EMA. Of interest, um, a very tiny percentage of patients in recent trials have been in the US. Most of them have been outside of the US. Uh, and the FDA does have a, a written requirement that a certain minimum must be in the US, but many of the recent trials have not met that minimum and drugs have been approved anyway. Uh, Thank you. Next question is, how do overall development costs differ for tier A versus B versus C or versus D? Yeah, great question. Um, well, tier A and B are probably going to be about similar, but what it depends on is it depends a lot on the clinical indication that you might be studying. For example, this really small trial that I think I mentioned that that, plays, that the Achaeogen carried out for plazomycin, where they looked at very seriously ill patients treated with either colistin or plazomycin. Um, I think they paid something like a million dollars a patient at the end of the day because they had to screen so many patients 
um, to get a single one that could actually be uh, evaluated in a trial, that it became very expensive. Uh, another very expensive indication to study is hospital-acquired pneumonia, where you, you pay uh, much more money per patient. Um, so those tend to be very high-cost trials, uh, which would be included in Tier A and B. But they also might be included in Tier C, so you might have a smaller trial, but with much more seriously ill patients. And again, the, the more seriously ill the patient is, it, they t that tends to increase the cost. But because we haven't had much, if any, experience with so-called Tier C trials, it's hard for me to um, estimate costs across all those. Uh, tier D um, has a relatively fixed cost, which is around uh, the animal work that you do, uh, the phase one clinical work that you do, the PK essentially that you have to do in humans is not that expensive, but the animal work is is fairly expensive. But I don't think it compares to um, what you'd have to do if you did two um, phase three non-inferiority trials. Thank you. So in in terms of enrollment efficiency of patients into trials, what impact have uh, rapid diagnostics such as those that are available currently made on this? Good question. As far as I know, uh, none, because I don't think rapid diagnostics have really made an impact on enrollment in trials. But I, I think that people are very confused about this because as um, Ed Cox of the FDA continually points out, um, a rapid diagnostic just identifies patients for you, but it doesn't increase the number of patients uh, with a given pathogen or a given uh, clinical syndrome. So uh, it does increase the efficiency of, um, of the trial in the sense that you screen fewer patients to get ones that you can evaluate, but it doesn't increase the numbers available for you to actually evaluate. Uh, so I think people need to be clear about that. But I don't, I don't know of a trial that's used um, rapid diagnostics as a way of, as part of the actual screening process for getting a patient into the trial. Most rapid diagnostics just are not uh, designed with that in mind as it stands right now. Thank you. So the next question is sometimes you hear about adaptive design clinical trials to accelerate antibacterial discovery. Can you comment on what these are? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, tetraphase, uh, and this trial actually ultimately failed, but tetraphase ran a trial in complicated urinary tract infection, which was an adaptive design trial. And what they did was uh, pe people were uh, entered in the trial and given a standard dose of the intravenous formulation of the drug, and then one of two doses of the oral formulation of the drug uh, after an initial response. Um, then what they did is after the first 100 or so patients or 150 patients, um, they made a determination about uh, the dose of the oral drug for continuing the rest of the phase three trial. So this was a phase three trial which um, where there was a decision after a certain number of patient entries to remove one of the dosage groups on the in the oral uh, for the oral um, and that's one of the ways that you can use an adaptive design uh, trial there are others but you you get the idea the idea is that you you make a, a decision about some aspect of the trial after a certain number of patients have been entered and then you continue the trial and then all those patients are available at the end of the of the trial, but all of this has to be uh, uh, stated up front before you ever start the trial. This all has to be clear in terms of your statistical design and it has to be cleared with the regulatory authorities before you even start. Thank you. 
So you mentioned that one of the major hurdles for patient recruitment into clinical trials is that they have received prior antibiotic therapy. Are there any differences as to how this is considered by the European Medicines Agency versus the FDA? Well, neither agency likes you to, <laughs> to uh, give prolonged doses of antibiotics that might treat the pathogen that you're actually studying for your drug. Um, the Europeans have, uh, the EMA has a little more flexible rules about how many days of antibiotics you can give, but the, again, because most people develop drugs uh, um, for uh, uh, the world, they want to get approval in both regions, so they follow um, they, they follow the uh, the advice of the most conservative agency, which in this case is the FDA, which uh, doesn't allow more than um, either a single dose or maximum 24 hours of uh, another potentially active antibiotic. Thank you. The next question is, does development of topical antibiotics follow the same rules as those you've been discussing so far? Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> um, so they have a totally different um, safety paradigm that they go through. Um, they do have to show safety and efficacy in a clinical sort of trial, um, but it is quite different than what I've discussed, and I don't think I know enough about it to give anyone details on it. I do know something about the safety aspects of it, but not about the kind of phase three trial aspects of it, sorry. Thank you, David. In fact, it's, it's probably pertinent to point out to everyone listening to the Q&A for this webinar, if, if there are any questions that are outside of scope for you or based on the webinar, we can always have the Ask an Expert um, facility on the Revive website, and we'll be mentioning this at the end of the Q&A session. So moving on to the next question, New antibiotics are often targeted to a specific resistance problem and will be used mainly in critically ill patients who are usually excluded from clinical trials. Does this ultimately affect the treatment of such patients with these new drugs? Yeah, so that's another good question. Basically, the, the question is, if all the patients you studied are not so critically ill, how do you know it will work in critically ill patients? And the answer is uh, in a number of examples now um, that you don't and that what you must do is you must establish some way to bridge between what your, what your trial is studying and those patients who might ultimately be treated. Um, for example, You've carried out several trials already, say in urinary tract infection and intra-abdominal infection, and you want to go into uh, nosocomial pneumonia where patients are much more seriously ill. Um, what you should do is do a pharmacokinetic study in those patients to make sure that the exposures to your drug are the same as what you had in your previously successful trials. Um, and it may be that the dose for patients with uh, nosocomial pneumonia or seriously ill patients might be different than the dose used in patients who are less severely ill. And that's something that you, you need to know going into trials where you're going to be studying uh, more severely ill patients. So as a, a follow-up to that, um, at what stage would you do the pharmacokinetic trials in that critically ill target patient population? Yeah, um, good question. I mean, if it were me, I would do it once I knew I was getting success in some of the earlier indications and I knew that I was going to have to go forward and uh, carry out studies in the critically ill population. Um, but you usually figure that out, you know, well before you need to actually start those trials. So you could do the, you do have time to do the pharmacokinetic studies, uh, in, you know, in a reasonable time frame. So I think that works well. Thank you. 
So I've received a question, which is really two questions in one. So I will ask you the first, and then for the person who's asked this question, I will follow up with the second part. So the question is, could you please share your thoughts on the need for and current status of narrow spectrum agents? Hmm. Um, well, I think we'd like to have narrow spectrum agents. Um, to, if for nothing else, because of uh, a need for good antibiotic stewardship. Um, and there are several in clinical trials as we speak. Um, but I think the question, the, the problem is that we, the regulatory pathway for these um, is still not entirely clear. Uh, so I think we're gonna have to wait and see how they these drugs do in their development pathway and what issues come up uh, along the way. Uh, so the current status, I would say right now, is we're waiting to see. So the second part of this question, in fact, there really is a third part, so I'll now go to the second part, is could you please share your thoughts on the need for and current status of antivirulence agents? Uh, uh, well, that's even less known because there's really no proof of concept for antivirulence agents either in therapy or as prophylaxis. So um, I think it's a reasonable idea. Uh, we actually worked on this a little bit when I was at WIA, so we thought about it. Um, but I think we need to have some kind of a, a proof of concept for for this and I think that these trials um, because there's no real proof of concept are going to be uh, of greater risk. And coming back to the first part of the question which was about narrow spectrum agents again is there a need for or current status of narrow spectrum agents for prophylaxis rather than for therapy? Yeah, I think that's a good question also. Well, there are, as you know, there are several monoclonal antibodies in trials now as prophylaxis against pseudomonas infections. Um, and uh, I think if we had something like that, it would be great. Uh, but whether these will actually work, again, there's no proof of concept for this. Uh, so we're, we're still waiting to see. So a lot of new things going on with antibiotic R&D. So the next question, is how about aerosol delivery of a novel drug? Is there a precedent? Well, there's lots of precedent for that in the cystic fibrosis population, and this appears to work. But the cystic fibrosis population is a very special population, and um, it, it's clear to me that you can't extrapolate from what works there to what might work in some, somebody with nosocomial pneumonia. Um, and I'm not sure if I know, I mean, there are lots of trials going on of aerosol delivery of various drugs, especially known antibiotics in patients with hospital acquired pneumonia. Um, but I'm not aware of any of them that have really shown clearly that this works, uh, especially as a, a standalone therapy. Um, so, Again, here I would say we're awaiting further development, but here I'm a little bit more skeptical than perhaps others might be. Thank you. So the next question is, how do the regulatory agencies balance the risk of small size trials with possible adverse events once a new drug has been approved and marketed? Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, another good question. And what the regulatory agencies do is they make it clear in their label uh, that this is based on a small data set and should only be used in patients who have limited or no other options. And of course, automatically, this reduces the potential patient population for therapy to something much smaller than it might have otherwise been. Um, but I think it's obviously a reasonable thing for 
us all to consider that if you're going to carry out a very small trial and increase the risks to a larger population, you don't want to move into a larger population quickly. Thank you. When testing a drug in phase three, it is compared to the best available treatment. As newly approved drugs with a better safety profile than colistin, for instance, are only available in the United States, is it ethical to use colistin as a comparator in clinical trials in other countries? Actually, I think it's ethical to do it in the United States. I, I actually published a blog on this where I looked at, uh, with the help of uh, Alan Carr at Needham, I looked at uh, the use of uh, Avicaz uh, to treat carbapenem resistant enterobacteria ACI infections versus colistin and polymyxin to treat the same infections. Uh, and I looked at this going back to the launch of Avicaz in 2015. Um, in the U.S. And, and what's clear to me is that the vast majority of patients are still being treated with these inferior and toxic drugs, colistin and polymyxin. So they are, as far as I can tell, still the drug of choice for most physicians in the U.S. So absolutely, you can, can, you can I think, you can still study um, you, uh, a new drug using colistin as a comparator because that's what that's the gold standard uh, as far as physicians are concerned. Why that's true, I don't understand, but it is true. Thank you. Is there any scope to develop a trial protocol for a beta-lactamase inhibitor, for example, not in a fixed combination with an existing antibiotic to enable use with more than one antibiotic? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, and actually, this was tried uh, a number of years ago um, in Germany. Uh, Solbactam, which is a beta lactamase, an, an older beta lactamase inhibitor, was uh, marketed in Germany as a single drug to be used in combination with any other beta lactam. The name of it was Combactam in Germany. Um, and I think it sold a total of $10. And the reason that it wasn't taken up is that physicians don't know how to do this. The, the vast majority of physicians don't know how to decide what antibiotic they should pair it with or what dosage they should use of the two uh, different uh, drugs. This is something that uh, needs to be sorted out uh, in clinical trials in a very careful way. And it's not something, and if it's not something that you can do by taking a beta-lactamase inhibitor and combining it with several different antibiotics and carrying out different trials for each of those. That's just impossibly expensive. Uh, and you'd never get any return. And I'm not sure that um, it would be a wise thing to do clinically either. Um, so the short answer is no. Thank you. How do you compare the costs of clinical development versus those for early discovery phases in pharmaceutical companies when developing antibacterial drugs? Uh, clinical development is expensive. Early stuff is cheap. Um, but, and here's this, the hook, um, almost most things in early, develop, in early uh, phases uh, preclinical fail. So somebody has to pay for all the failures, right? And the failures are actually very expensive component overall. But for any given compound, um, the early discovery phases are much cheaper than clinical development. So a follow-up question. When we hear hundreds of millions of US dollars quoted as the cost to develop a new antibiotic, do these costs are just uh, come from that single drug that has been developed, or do they include the costs for failures as well, perhaps in a related series of drugs? Well, it depends on the number you're talking about. If it's actually one or $200 million, that's within the range of what uh, a single drug development program would cost. But the big number that uh, is thrown around is $2.6 billion, which is the cost to bring a single drug to market uh, 
uh, you know, any drug to market. Um, and that $2.6 billion takes into account all of the failures. And that's why it's such a big number. Thank you. So I've received quite a, a focused question here, but I think it's worth uh, placing a question with you uh, because there may be many people from the US listening in. Do you find Medicare's new technology add-on payment, NTAP program, helpful? If not, why not? And um, what would it take to make the program workable? Oh man, that's a really hard question, especially for me. Um, yeah, it, apparently it's, it doesn't work well. Um, and uh, especially for antibiotics anyway, it seems to work better for other things, uh, but for antibiotics it apparently doesn't work well. I'm not exactly sure uh, why it doesn't work well, and therefore I can't comment on what it would take to make the program workable, but I'm sure there's somebody in the Revive hub that knows more about this than me. So I'm gonna plead ignorance here, sorry. No, that was a good answer. Thank you, David. In fact, that's, again, another reason why we have the Ask a, an Expert forum in the Revive Hub on our website. And we encourage people to go to that if they want any further uh, questions or elaboration from the answers David's given so far. So we'll move on to the next question. What is the position uh, of the development of topical antimicrobial drugs against multi-drug resistant bacteria, for instance, Pseudomonas in Burns patients? Yeah, so my experience with Pseudomonas infections in burn patients is that patients with serious infections require systemic therapy, period. Um, and it's not clear to me that the earlier use of topical agents prevent those infections from becoming more serious than they might have otherwise been. Uh, so I, I have a little bit of a bias about this because I did spend uh, some time working in a hospital that had a burn unit and saw quite a number of Pseudomonas infected burn wounds. Um, so I'm not sure about how important topical antimicrobial drugs would be in that situation or how important they are in quite a number of other situations where people like to look at topicals. Um, but I mean, I have kind of a bias about that, to be honest. Thank you. As far as you're aware, are there any efflux pump inhibitors in clinical trials? Um, I don't think there are. Um, I'd have to go to clinicaltrials.gov to, to see for sure, but I, I don't think there are as yet any efflux pump inhibitors in clinical trials. So a follow-on to that is clearly in your presentation, you discussed these lactamase inhibitors as being able to uh, bring back the activity of a drug that had already been successfully used in patients, keftazidine. Are there any other um, add-ons that, that could potentiate or bring back the use of drugs that were previously very active? So not an efflux pump inhibitor, not a beta-lactamase inhibitor, but something else that could be used in combination. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine quite a number of things. Um, the problem is that um, once you get outside of beta-lactamases and efflux pumps, everything gets extremely specific. So you could imagine a, um, a methylase inhibitor that would uh, result in uh, reactivation or, you know, a, a kind of rescue of a macrolid antibiotic like erythromycin or something like that. Uh, but there are many different methylases out there and many other different mechanisms of macrolid resistance. So, you know, would, would that really work? Another one you could imagine, which might actually be a good idea, would be um, a PBP2 a inhibitor for methicillin resistant staph aureus because those infections are still fairly common um, and having something like that might be uh, might be useful but it's not a 
you know, a combination inhibitor anymore, really. It's an actual antibiotic. So, I, I, you know, in terms of things like efflux inhibitors or beta-lactamase inhibitors, I'm a bit at a loss to find something that's not going to be so specific as to be not, as to be impractical. Thank you. So, what is the most advanced development of antimicrobial peptides? In other words, how good are antimicrobial peptides um, and the clinical trial status of these? As far as I know, the actual peptides are mainly still preclinical. Um, there is a peptidomimetic that's in phase three trials, I believe, right now from uh, Polyfor, which is this uh, peptidomimetic active against Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, acting through a novel target. Um, but it's not, I mean, uh, uh, it's really more a peptidomimetic than it is a, a peptide. Um, the problem with the antimicrobial peptides in general, there are several problems. One is um, they don't, they frequently uh, have problems with pharmacokinetics. They're not stable. Um, and uh, the other problem is that they tend to have toxicity because they tend to work on membranes and they don't always have enough specificity for bacterial membranes compared to people membranes. Um, but there have been some antimicrobial peptides that look like they ought to be good. They are, you know, they seem to be stable in human plasma. They have worked in animal models um, and they appear to be less toxic. But I don't know that any of them have gotten as far as to get into certainly phase two and phase three clinical trials. Thank you. So the next question is, are, any, are novel antibiotic drug scaffolds currently a bottleneck? Yeah, I think what this question means is, um, are we doing a good enough job exploring chemical space uh, to to find new antibiotics. And I think the answer to that is we're not doing a good enough job. Part of the problem being that we don't understand um, the kinds of scaffolds we ought to be look, targeting or looking at uh, more closely, although we are getting a much better understanding of that now as our understanding of how we can get molecules in through the gram-negative outer membrane is improving. So um, as we get more experience there, I expect we will start seeing more uh, novel drug scaffolds uh, coming through. It has been stated by some that actually we do not need any new scaffolds we, or new targets. What we need to do is improve upon those that we have already. What is your view on this? Hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I guess my feeling is that we should do everything, uh, but we should weigh what we do against the risks of what we're doing. So novel targets are a higher risk. So yes, we should have effort against novel targets, but in our priority scheme, they might not be as high as finding novel scaffolds active against known targets. Uh, so I think, you know, you have to think along those lines in terms of uh, risks as you balance your different programs. Thank you. So we've had a question about bacteriophage. Uh, so with particular respect to clinical trials, um, what is your position on how you would carry out a clinical trial for a bacteriophage preparation? Right. Well, the reason that people haven't carried out <laughs> trials for bacteriophages really is that the, uh, at least in kind of the developed world and in modern settings, um, is that it's just so extraordinarily difficult to, to actually do it. Um, there has been some very, you know, encouraging uh, data on using bacteriophages in individual patients with serious infections with success. And there has, there's old data on people with not so serious infections where, you know, bacteriophages have actually worked. Um, 
but um, in terms of actually carrying out a clinical trial, um, the, there, there are so many difficulties in terms of uh, the, the composition of the bacteriophages and providing a, a, a standard and quality preparation uh, for the trial to say nothing of dosage and uh, reproducibility of the cocktail that you might have to use and all these things that um, people just have not gotten to the point of being able to do it. Uh, I suppose someday we will be able to do it, but right now it's, it's still been very difficult. Thank you. Moving on to a different type of antibacterial now, what are your thoughts on lysins? Uh, well, I had some direct experience with lysostaphin. Um, I think lysins, I mean, it's an interesting idea, but there are lysins that are now being uh, developed uh, active against gram positives, active against gram negatives. Uh, you see this in the literature. Um, I think that it's challenging because uh, they're proteins. You can develop immune, immune reactions to these proteins. Um, uh, and there are also issues around distribution to sites of infection and within sites of infection uh, that might make it uh, difficult. But they do, certainly, they, they haven't shown to work in animal models, so that's encouraging. Um, so I, I don't have any... Uh, Ne either negative or particularly negative or positive thoughts on uh, license. I, I'm kind of in a wait and see mode, but there are some that are, I would guess, be going into uh, clinical trials. I mean, there one, there is one, I believe, in clinical trials now. Uh, so we're, I guess, we're going to see um, how this works. But my big worry about them is going to be the immune reaction, especially in patients who might require repeated therapy. Thank you. Um, there's been quite a lot of discussion about uh, monoclonals uh, being developed to use against a variety of different bacterial infections. Um, what are the particular challenges of doing clinical trials with monoclonals compared to conventional antibacterial? Yeah, well, most of the trials that have been done with monoclonals so far have been uh, prophylactic trials, and that's probably the easiest way forward because, again, there's really no proof of principle. It would be hard to get clinicians comfortable with using monoclonals as uh, single therapy for seriously ill patients. Um, and if you try and combine it with an antibiotic, then you don't always know what the antibiotic is doing versus what the monoclonal is doing. So, um, you know, I think that the way it's been done so far, which is to start anyway with prophylaxis, and then maybe if you have success there, think about going on to uh, therapy is, is probably a, a reasonably conservative way of, of going forward. There has also been a suggestion that one way of dealing with certain bacterial infections is to develop uh, therapeutics that target the immune response and make it better able to deal with some infections or alternatively damp down the immune response. Again, with respect to clinical trials, how could you envisage such a trial would uh, be carried out? Well, we've tried some of those approaches in sepsis, and, you know, and it didn't work very well. Um, you know, playing with the immune response to me is kind of like playing with Mother Nature. Um, but that said, again, there's, there's, it's one of these areas where there's no proof of concept and it's hard to imagine a way forward outside of something like prophylaxis to, to start with, similar to what you might do with monoclonals. Um, but stimulating the immune response, you know, this is, a, could be a, a double-edged sword and might have some risk. So the, you know, I think people who get, get into that area need to be very careful going forward clinically uh, uh, in the early stages of clinical trials to make sure they're not hurting people. Thank you. So you mentioned the need for market entry rewards to stimulate new drug development. In your opinion, how high would a market entry reward need to be to achieve this goal? Hmm. 
Well, I mean, there are 10 gazillion articles on this from people who know a lot more than me, but my number is about $2 billion uh, total. That doesn't mean that any one country has to provide the $2 billion, and it doesn't mean that it has to be you know, in one sort of market entry reward. It might be different, different countries might have different means of doing this. Um, but I think the number that would work would be something like $2 billion. So the last question I'm going to have time to ask you before uh, I close the session is, how does a startup argue the market case for antibiotic development, given the traditionally low medication prices? Oh, man. <laughs> um, I think a startup has to pray for market entry rewards. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think the, the the antibiotics that have been successful to date have been um, those that fill uh, a niche that's a, a big niche with high need. Like a good example was uh, linazolid, which was the only orally active drug for the treatment of MRSA infections. Uh, and it was launched in 1999, and that was a very successful drug, and they were able to charge a relatively high price, especially for the time, and be successful. Um, so you you have to identify a big enough niche that would uh, uh, with a high enough need that would allow you to successfully charge these high prices, um, and uh, I, I think it's a tough argument right now. Thank you. So unfortunately, we have run out of time now. So those of you who've posted additional questions, we will put them on the public forum on the Revive website in the next few days, and we will do our best to respond to these. Uh, please do visit Revive uh, for more follow-up information, as well as announcements of our upcoming webinars. So speaking of that, I'm really pleased to announce that we will host another webinar in a few weeks' time. On June 26, Professor William Hope will talk about PKPD in support of accelerated programs for antimicrobial development. And this will also be followed by a live Q&A. So with this, I would like to thank everybody for joining this webinar and thank David once more for his support of Revive and GARP and for an excellent webinar and Q&A session. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody, bye.